So, um, welcome everyone um, to yet another Silicon Gardens meet. Um, my name is Kresha Gotovets and I'll be your host for the day. It's been a uh, uh, little over a month since our last talk with uh, the Bird Body founders, but it almost feels like ages flew by as uh, all the activities go happening around and uh, within the Silicon Gardens uh, during this time. Uh, I'm glad to say that uh, the community is growing steadily and uh, with founders and experts joining uh, daily. And meanwhile, our founders or founders funds uh, made investments into two new exciting startups and one of which obviously will be able to uh, meet, meet today. Uh, and finally, with portfolio companies reporting good progress, we might say that uh, all is well in our little garden. Uh, well. Silicon Gardens. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Silicon Gardens meet events, let me just say that um, they are only uh, one of the benefits uh, that we are providing to support our portfolio uh, companies and um, the local founders as well. Um, the purpose of these events is to highlight uh, inspirational startup stories, um, discuss pressing entrepreneurial issues um, and connect founders with similar challenges uh, to uh, allow for uh, transfer knowledge, uh, transfer of knowledge and uh, of uh, experience. So today will we'll not be different at all um, as we are happy to host uh, the Juicy Marbles team um, and Silicon Garden Zone, uh, Yugoslav Petkovic, with whom we'll take a deep dive into Topics such as food tech, uh, Y Combinator, um, rebranding, uh, patenting, and so on. Uh, and all, of course, through the story of plant-based steaks um, and the future of uh, uh, food supply sustainability, if, if we put it like that. Um, one last little thing before we jump into it, um, a few uh, technical details. So basically, um, just keep your cameras and microphones turned off uh, for the duration of uh, this first part for, for the chat. Afterwards, uh, as the Q&A starts, we'll ask you to turn them on when your turn comes. And um, so, so, so our guests know who, who is setting the question. And um, if you have a question during the chat, please post it into a Zoom chat, um, into the feed um include your names so we know who to call out uh, when the q a starts uh will be roughly an hour um with the first part and then yeah uh, one, uh half an hour at most for the questions um if there are too many questions we'll just go uh through those that that we'll have time for um so that's about it i think um now without further ado uh let me introduce our guests um, for the day. Uh, firstly, um, they're a team who started out as a demo in their home kitchens, I guess. Uh, and now they are uh, the latest Slovenian startup uh, in line of the select few who made it into the Y Combinator program. Um, they now go by name of Formidable Foods. I hope I uh, pronounced it well. Um, in the back and in the front lines, on the front lines as juicy marbles. Welcome Tilan Traunik, Mai Hrovat, Luka Sinček and uh, Vladimir Mičković. Thank you guys for taking time. Also with us um, is a serial entrepreneur and experienced leader and one of the most um, active uh, startup mentors, I would say in Slovenia. Um, about 15 years ago, he co-founded and then uh, led Mimo Vrste and Domenza with, uh, with great success. And today he is leading Flaviar uh, to what I would say an even greater impact, obviously a global one. He is a Silicon Gardens Fund investor. He is a Y Combinator alumni. And some say he is a culinary enthusiast. Uh, welcome, Hugo Petkovic. Hi, Hugo. Thank you for being here today. Hello. Hi. 
So uh, let's jump into it a little bit. Uh, uh, I'd say a warm up for you guys, so you you feel your English uh, before you go into deep <laughs> deep story. Um, Dylan and the others, could you please give our audience a bit of an overview? Who is who actually in your team? Who does what? Uh, who is responsible for what? Okay, um, sure. Uh, so maybe I'll start um, with saying that in the phase of a startup that we are currently in, uh, we are still pretty much uh, in the all hands on the deck and you know everybody does the thing that is has to be done uh that goes especially between the three of us uh so luca my and and um, myself um, um but we are now starting to kind of um express interests and um, benchmark ourselves uh against like more defined roles um so uh myself as um you know formerly the ceo taking care of, about a lot of the admin um and and you know getting funds to hit our account um while still you know um doing more hands-on things like you know setting up new production spaces and stuff like that uh luca uh, being the uh kind of guy in the field um you know ramping up demand plus uh, talking to partners and investors, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and we kind of share this role. And then Mai is our, you know, our tech genius um, who, um, you know, basically studies any field necessary and creates a prototype uh, over the weekend. And Vladimir, who um, <laughs> we we have a we have a word for it, but no, um, no, he's actually. The, <laughs> <laughs> he uh he is he's the he's the the the, the brains behind our, our brand um and um not, not just the brains but also the uh the guts um the balls behind our marbles um because it, 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 it we needed we need we internally first of all needed a little bit of uh convincing that this is a brand that we we can um uh, get behind uh once he successfully did that he um uh, it wasn't yeah. that hard. It wasn't that hard. You you, you give you give yeah, me yeah, way was, too I, much credit. You gave me too much credit. I, you, I was, you guys I was, were on board from second one. Yeah, uh, true, true. But you but, forgot the most important role. I'm 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 cooking for you guys. Or let's exactly. say exactly. Yeah, yeah, I was. I was. <laughs> yeah. So the, the idea was that I would I would kind of ask each of you guys to to explain one thing that you do. Uh, uh, you know, with, with the most passion in our teams. And uh, for sure, Vladimir would say cooking and, and making food look good, good and taste uh, great. Hence his formal um, form, formal title, which is senior crust developer. I have a passion for the crust, that's why. But I, I also saw that Luca now implemented a, a nice title. What was it, a flavor? Uh... No, flavor customer support. Something yeah, like flavor, that. flavor support, flavor support, center. flavor support. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, very closely. <laughs> <Sounds exciting. laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm sure that Vladimir, Vladimir will have uh, uh, something to say later on when we hit the rebranding section. Um, but for now, let's let's uh, keep it streamlined to to, uh, to 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 the start of the conversation. And um, Hugo, could you could you please jump in and uh, give us a little bit of an update? What are you currently working on uh, i've mentioned some of the things where you're most active at, at at this point and perhaps could you tell us are there any uh, touch points left with the y combinator at the moment yeah sure so flavia went uh, through y combinator in 2014 summer of 2014 um and uh um since then of course the the um number of, of interactions with YAC went down quite uh, quite dramatically. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you, you need them less and you, you reach out to them less. They primarily try to stay in touch to make sure that they know what's going on with the company. But anytime you have a problem, it's they're usually still one of the first people you reach out to, especially if it's a problem that you would think they have, uh, they have some um, ability to work through. Like, you know, if it's 
with an investor in the U.S. that is giving you a hard time uh, or having you know some unreasonable uh, requests or something like that. I I can say that that uh, we've had a lot of uh, instances where where that be, where that was um, helpful, but uh, certainly I'm also an investor in a few other companies where I saw secondhand the um, the, the the lengths they went through to protect the founders and the company and to um to to, to um, try to iron out issues where uh, where they felt uh, there was injustice being done to the company or something like that uh, but other than that yeah um, as far as as far as my update update goes I'm um, definitely hundred percent focused on on getting Flaviar uh, even further mm-hmm. and on the um, kind of angel investing uh, or um, startup ecosystem side I am hundred uh, percent at uh, Silicon Gardens. Super, thank you. Well, let's dig in now, uh, Dylan, uh, Luca, Vladimir, and Mai. Um, who are the one to, to tell tell us the story, basically, uh, behind your idea? So, in the in the uh, PR, I put uh, cows, humans, and plants, mm-hmm. and the, the ratio between cows and humans, etc. So, what is what is it all about, and where does this this uh, idea come from, and what is your big vision? Sure, maybe I can take that. Uh, so as a true Genesis story, Maya and I met while at university still. Uh, we were both studying microbiology and biotechnology respectively. Uh, and we started playing around with what we could do outside of the university, having entrepreneurial kind of ambition. Uh, and uh, the only thing that you can really do in uh, biotech, if you don't want to spend a hundred grand up front, is doing food tech. So we started it fermenting, developing hardware that we could use in a lab to make then a fermented uh, grain sausage or a fermented steak made out of uh, sunflower seeds. Uh, and then talking one day with uh, a colleague of ours, uh, he kind of said that, look, you should try Beyond. And we were vaguely familiar with like what Beyond is. Um, mm-hmm. So it, but it, it made a lot of sense because we were meat eaters, we still are. I, it resonated a lot because the things that we were working on previously really were uh, vegan plant-based meat alternatives. Like the first generation, your tofu, your tempeh, your whatever you want to call it. Uh, and this was like the second generation, something that could appeal to me as a meat eater. Um, and so we met Tilan at a random hackathon where we were kind of trying to get some money just so that we could further fund our uh, work in that field. Uh, and there we presented some crazy idea that we kind of came up with on the spot just to make sure that we would kind of look impressive and that most of the people would kind of understand, but it would be like, oh, some electronics, some biotechnology makes sense. Um, but still in being kind of uh, someone with the food tech experience and with biotech specialization, he kind of got it. Uh, and we started chatting and uh, we eventually pushed him to a point where he kind of joined the team as a mentor and then eventually joined the team as a mm-hmm. part-time. And then finally, uh, uh, I don't know, half a year ago, a year ago, I don't know how long ago it was, but committed fully. Uh, and we've been a team ever since. I mean, you might be aware of Altburger that we developed and launched in Spar, which was a great exercise for us. Uh, mm-hmm. But now we feel that we're really ready to attack this cow to human ratio to ensure that the food system of the future kind of gets to where it needs to be. So, so, so basically, it's not, uh, it's not a, a thing where where it's basically about the vegans or not vegans. So it's uh, uh, much more than that. Um, who are you know, who are your targets? Who, who's your, who will be buying your stakes? And yeah. Who are targeting? So, so uh, yeah, sorry, Tim. No, it's, 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 it's much more than that, right? We, we in, in the short term, we think that we have to make a product that is um, basically be going to be a, a viable replacement for an actual stake. Uh, and the target for that, for that, um, first product we, which we now think we have uh, ready uh, are so-called flexitarians, which are people who uh, eat meat, but they are aware or conscious about, um, you know, the environmental, ethical health issues, whatever, which one, which one ever they prefer of meat and want to do something about it, uh, want to start reducing their, their meat intake. Uh, and we want to be the first viable option, but the long, long vision is actually um, because the, you know, and th- this is kind of uh, a group that's not really 
um, that's not really uh, bound to be or close to vegans or veganism itself. Uh, but the, the vision of our company is to, to actually make a new category of products. Uh, I always like to pull the, the, Red Bull, the Red Bull analogy. You know, before there was Red Bull, nobody knew what an energy drink was. Uh, now, you know, this is an established category. And we feel that, um, you know, plant protein products are going to be a separate category, which is, you know, it's not going to be anymore. Will you have fish or meat or, you know, plant fish or plant meat, but it's going to be just, you know, that third thing that is, that is just, you know, a category in, in its own and it's praised for its, for, for the, and uh, for, for the properties. Uh, at the same time, we, you know, honestly, we don't believe that um, meat will go away totally. Uh, but the majority of meats will be somehow replaced by one or the other technology. Yeah, yeah. and, and if, if I can, I just... can... yeah, sorry, sorry. My... <laughs> if I can build upon, build upon that, basically, uh, technology te technology allows us to make something that's uh, not from animals, but in some regards is quite similar to animal derived products, but in some other regards, basically being a lot better, you know, for the environment, maybe for human health, nutrition wise. Or maybe just have some different texture, right? Uh, meat is quite chewy and the flavor release is quite intense, but then it falls off. While our product can be, you know, flavor uh, milder, milder in flavor, but the flavor could last longer and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, but also what we're trying to, 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 to kind of communicate is that all meat essentially does come from plants and yeah. that the, basically the current system, the way it's set up, is just, uh, um, we want to point out the inefficiency of it. So that we, that's why we're putting currently a lot of these charts on our website. Like uh, mm -hmm. for instance, if you feed a cow 100 soybeans, only three will reach the human stomach, right? So that speaks volumes about how inefficient the system is. And as, as we are now in a completely new context as, as, as a humanity, we need to act accordingly. So, you know, let's just, source the meat closer to where it's actually coming from, right? Because most cows are fed uh, uh, soybeans, right? Uh, grains of some sort. So we cut out the middle man, the middle cow and, 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 go, and go straight to the source. That's kind of like, we're trying to contextualize the people that uh, as Thielen says, this category is basically the true meat. And thanks to technology today, you can uh, recreate the experience of meat. And part of that experience is also, it's not just the, the texture, the juiciness, the tenderness and all of that. It's also how easy it is to prepare, right? You just need to sprinkle a little salt, put it on a pan and you have a, a tasty protein on your plate. So that's our product checks out all of those marks, right? But there's obviously, you know, there's differences among each of the meats. That's why I think Tilian is, is uh, saying that uh, we want to own this as a new category eventually yeah, because that's, it offers that's, so much more. Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting claim. I mean, um, I think Luca mentioned Beyond Burgers and there are some other players here. Yeah. Would you say, yeah, would you say that they're already, they already started this category or? Oh, certainly. I mean, do you find yourself different and how different do you find yourself? You know, why do you I, fence your chances against them? Oh, sure. I think they started the plant-based category. Uh, but okay. to win people with the plant-based category, you can't do it with sausages and burgers. You're going to need to be able to put like a proper piece of meat on a plate for someone. I mean, when you go to a well-established restaurant, you don't expect to get a burger. Obviously, mm -hmm. with the kind of early days of plant-based, you would get an impossible burger in a fancy restaurant. But what you really want to get is a proper steak that's going to be juicy. Uh, and this works in many cases. I mean, people who eat kosher, who eat halal, these can be offered as a replacement for them in some certain ways. Uh, but more than that, I mean, having this at your home to cook with, to experiment with, to kind of become a tool for a home chef to feed their families and friends, uh, that's what's going to be a game changer. And that's why we believe that we have more than a fair chance of competing with these companies that you mentioned. Well, and sounds exciting. Mostly, mostly beyond, beyond and Impossible are actually using the existing technologies that were developed by the meat industry to basically make okay. the burgers, the minced meat products, more efficient, you know, you could mix some soy in with, uh, you know, protein texturates, 
But uh, now when the, their brands actually establish some new category of plant-based uh, protein products, mm -hmm. um, there is a place for new pro processing technologies that make greater products that were not possible before because consumers would not understand them and not buy them because uh, why would they? So uh, that's the only reason I think the people are currently actually um, buying $150 worth of you know, plant-based steak, right? Yeah, because, yeah, so is not that expensive, you know. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Hugo, uh, would you, yeah, would you, you've been, I'd say, deep into the food tech uh, trenches for some time now. Um, you know, could you give us a bit of your perspective on uh, what this sector is basically looking for, what is characterized by, and, uh, you know, what are the popular niches, brands, and how do you see uh, what guys just explained, uh, will this should this play into their uh, advantage? Yeah, I mean, um, from a, I mean, I'm, I'm by no means a, a, a food tech expert. The beverages are very, 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 very different than than uh, um, food. Um, that being said, I'm, um, you know, um, uh, an enthusiast uh, uh, in uh, when it comes to food and and uh, culinary world. Um, you know, and, and discussing what the future is of food a year ago versus today is a, is a quite a different topic. A year ago, we'd be yeah. discussing, um, you know, is Scandinavian uh, cuisine still the, the 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 one that's gonna be in all the restaurants, and you know that everybody's trying to mimic, etc. Now, with restaurants closed for the majority of the last twelve months, um, the the interesting thing that happened is that the focus in the in the food world has turned to sustainability. Mm -hmm. So, like, we've gone mm -hmm. from a very profane uh, discussion of like which flavors and seasonings and and uh, and things like that we'll be using for the next uh, you know year and which restaurant is uh, tops the the number the, the top 50 uh, list etc to discussing shit where are we going to even get all the food that we need to feed the planet mm -hmm. over the next uh, decades and it's a, it's an interesting shift um, and um, from that perspective I think two 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 big trends are are um, um, that I've been seeing uh, discussed a lot uh, uh, that are coming up uh, in the last 12 months are um, biomanufacturing uh, and and uh, uh, climate change. Um, and you see you see people like Bill Gates start to talk about climate change and reinvesting his fortunes instead of in uh, uh, vaccines into into climate change. I'm not sure why what, what could be the reason he's shifting away from vaccines, but um, I think the 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 um, that's definitely a huge uh, tailwind uh, to to what Juicy Marbles are are doing, mm -hmm. um, because it's just that the discussion is going to be about this and the and the realization, you know, I, I think some of the stats that 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 uh, we've heard mentioned today, or if anybody's following Juicy Marbles on Instagram, that you're learning from from their social feed, like. Um, are, are staggering. You know, you have a you have an incredibly inefficient system that feeds animals, so gross crops for a year to feed a, sure. an animal for a year, only to then end up feeding a handful of, of people as a yeah. result, and in the meantime, emitting um, uh, you know um, very har harmful gases into the atmosphere yeah. uh, at each stage of that process. Um, so it's it's a it's a very problematic concept in general, and I think um, what's happened is also the technology of that I mentioned uh, of, of uh, bio manufacturing has progressed to a point where you can apparently we're now able to program you know bacteria to do stuff we want, and those those uh, that those bacteria can use soybeans, they can use fungi, they can use various components to create something new. You basically program program them. You tell them build this. You know, here's a snippet of DNA. Now go and build this. Basically, a sort of fermentation process that happens yeah. that builds shit. I mean, not shit. It builds food, <laughs> um, which is even better. Um, and so um, that is insanely, you know interesting and scary at the same time um and uh so yeah i think it's it's a huge huge tailwind uh and it, mm -hmm. it couldn't be a better time to 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 be to be working on something like this and from a standpoint of like who is this you know who is a customer of this i mean i i 
you know, in anticipation of this call, I finally uh, uh, prepared my first uh, uh, my first meal today uh, for lunch um, uh, using some of the some of the filet mignon that I that I ordered uh, last week. Um, nice. And I have to say, I was I was blown away by by the experience, by the 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 the, the quality of the experience because. It truly is a, a, a replacement, a meat replacement, a very much a one-on-one -on -one meat replacement with several positive aspects to the to the uh, practical experience of like mm -hmm. you don't have to worry of undercooking it, overcooking it. You don't have to worry about um, you know. I mean, it does have some basic flavor profile, but you can build on top of it uh, whichever direction you want. Um, so it was a very very pleasant experience, um, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean. And then from a use case perspective in a restaurant, you know, when we, when as Silicon Gardens, we started talking to the team first, the, you know, there were several different iterations of, of, of uh, where the guys were uh, before landing on, on this direction. And some of the things that we were discussing is also, this is a great replacement, or this is a great product for the restaurant industry or for the catering industry where you have where you can easily switch in and out a, a plant-based uh, product for a meat product yeah, when yeah. you have a vegetarian. You basically serve the exact same dish. You have all the yeah. prep done for exact same exactly. seasoning, exact same sauce and garnishes, etc. You just change the protein, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. one for one. Yeah, uh, you know, no, no worries. So yeah, sounds, sounds fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess. I guess guys, Hugo is a, is a believer, and uh, maybe we can we can talk about are the, are the, are the people at the Y Combinator believers as well. Uh, oh. You know, could, could you take us a, a step step back into into time where you started thinking of uh, applying? When was that, and why why is that? Why did you basically um, uh, decide to try and and get accepted? Mm -hmm. I think we were pushed pushed into this idea by uh, Ljubljana's okay. university incubator. Uh, they really suggested that it's something that is like a holy grail of you know young startups to uh, to get into. Uh, we are not really sure that we are of the right you know materials to get into such an exquisite uh, accelerator. But uh, if I can just correct I my guess, hair, I we, weren't sure. <laughs> we weren't sure. We weren't sure. We weren't sure. I guess yeah. you are. Yeah. But. But when we started working on this, uh, this, this was at the time when we were focusing on the plant-based burger, right? So that was, uh, I guess, two years ago. Um, and we, um, we even applied uh, like for one batch before uh, in the early 2020. Um, didn't get in with the idea of making like a, a tabletop device for anyone to produce plant-based meat at, at home or for restaurants. Oh, okay. That was uh, the business idea plants, back yeah, then. Yeah. Uh, we we weren't really sure about how we would sell such a device, and the business plan was not, you know, really well crafted. And I think that's that's part of the reason why. Um, but when we went along and the product started being really good, um, it was the only the best thing that could happen. You know, if we could get into YC, we would get the full the proper funding to scale up the production. To make the product even better and uh, the stars aligned we basically told them in this uh, interview that they they have you know uh, b before you get accepted that um, if they want to try we can send them ship them some samples right yeah. and of course they did because uh, we insisted <laughs> and when they tried uh, one of the partners at yc uh, really was uh, amazed by what we can do and uh, basically took us under her wing so yeah, I mean, to be totally honest, we, we sent it to three YC partners. Yeah. Apparently, all of them liked it. Uh, and I would have to say that what we sent to them, if we were to present it to you today, you would not be impressed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was I mean, way, it was not bad worse. at all. Yeah. Uh, it was still a very pleasant experience. The taste was there. But I mean, when you look at the product now as it is, it truly looks like a steak. Uh, back then, we kind of we sent them three different products. We sent them like a chicken breast that we manually carved with a knife to someone to resemble the shape of a chicken. We sent them uh, ribs, barbecue ribs that we kind of impaled on bamboo sticks to give them the ribs part of it. Uh, smothered in barbecue sauce, vacuum package. I mean, I imagine that when they opened it, it was just like a horrible mess. Uh, but I mean, they prepared it, they fried it off, apparently loved it. 
And yeah, that's how we got in. It was actually quite scary because uh, I was the one who got the call. And during, I mean, at the time that I got in the call, I was kind of being a mentor at the uh, elementary school hackathon. <laughs> And they were doing their final pitches and I had my phone next to me and it was like plus one. Oh, that's a US number. Uh, and I was like, just a second. Uh, and I was on a call with Tracy, who's now our uh, YC partner for, I think, five minutes. It went on really fast. It was just mind blowing and super happy that we got the call. If, if I may add just one small thing, which I think is it is important. Um, Luca and my really wanted to be YC founders. You know, it was something that they, you know, almost regardless of the company they would build, they wanted to be YC, they, they wanted to go through that experience. I, at, at, at that point, I was kind of in between, um, uh, but, you know, now I, I, I you know, very much um, suggest any, any founder in, that has a proper, uh, an appropriate idea or, or you know, company that, that goes through that process or applies but I, I think that the, the the what what convinced me to to really you know try for real to get in uh, because it is quite a hard process you know you even you know had you go coach us on the on the pitch on the pitch interview etc on the on the acceptance interview but I think the, the 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 desire to be a YC founder goes a long way when it comes to uh, the way you prepare for the for the interviews, and this uh, applying for a second, third, and etc. times, this is something that that uh, is quite often, right? Yeah, yeah they, I mean, they even I can say brag about it, but it's mentioned, you know, in multiple okay. places in YC Startup School, which is which is a free program that they uh, they have uh, on their website. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we insisted that even though we don't have the, you know, the best business uh, plan at that time, we uh, applied for the first time before, you know, actually then applying for the second time and being accepted. So it was yeah. just like we planned, actually. So, <laughs> But then for the second time, I would just really have to put it on the record and thank our advisor, Ron Shigeta, who really pushed us and coached us in the yeah. first stages. And then thank Hugo and uh, Mateusz and all of the other YC alumni who kind of gave us the recommendation, which is something that YC alums can do. And I think it helped uh, okay. to get a recommendation from another startup uh, that they kind of looked at us more seriously. So huge thanks to all of you who did that. Uh, you go. Uh, you were. I'm not sure, but you were the second Slovenian startup, or the third in uh, Flavier was third. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you didn't good. have that many connections and uh, you know people who would vouch for you. Uh, was it this process uh, different for you then, back then, and how was it? How do you remember it? Yeah, I mean, uh, right now it's a it's a software supported process where it's easy to to recommend startups and uh, track who got accepted and who didn't. Before that, it was very very uh, manual, you know, sending emails, etc. So uh, or kind of entering stuff in a in a type of Google type of form. Um, but we still got a ton of help. So even Flaviar um, uh, was, uh, we, we applied to, to YC on insistence of uh, Mateusz Petek from Povio, mm -hmm. who insisted that we have to apply because we're the perfect company for YC. And we're like, oh, actually that's not a bad idea. Um, and then of course helped us a lot. And, and uh, we had some other, um, you know, people who, who coached us in the interviews and, and helped us work through it. And it, it's, it's a serious process. I mean, it's it's a process where if you take it seriously, um, it's not the 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 end result isn't just to get accepted. It is, it is also to hone your pitch to 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 make sure you have a good story to tell because all of a sudden you're competing against you know four thousand other companies that applied uh, for that batch or whatever the number is right now. Yeah, fifteen k. Um, fifteen thousand right now. Wow. <laughs> insane so right yeah. so they you know everybody says yeah well, well you know i see can they accept uh, they accept anyone they have a hundred plus uh, companies in a batch and two batches per year that's 200 uh, you know or 300 uh, companies per year but if you have tens of thousands of company companies applying that's still a very 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 low yeah. uh, acceptance yeah, sure. percentage and you have to put in some work and you have to be lucky and you have to um you have to have a you know, good enough idea. Um, and, 
And the one thing that, uh, that they tell you, or at least uh, they told us uh, um, uh, right after we joined, you know, I had this weird uh, first, uh, so after we got accepted before the program started, uh, the PG, who is the founder of YC, wanted to, he was kind of out of the operational work, but he was still kind of hanging around. He wanted to talk to us. Um, and I was the only one that, uh, in the US at that time. So I went to talk to him. And so I was grilled for like an hour plus. I, he did not like what he heard. It, he was like, what the hell are you doing? Like, what is this? He didn't get it. He, you know, why would you do this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then at some point I said something and I don't remember what I said exactly, but like he realized how big of an opportunity it is. And he's like, oh, wait, so this actually can be like a multi-billion dollar company and you can like go public and accept it. I mean, if you, if you guys do well, it can be huge. I was like, well, yeah. He's like, okay, good. Have a nice day. Um, <laughs> so that's, a, okay. that's a little anecdote um, of, uh, of, of what that first uh, um, stage looks like. Yeah, yeah, Very scary. Yeah. Very, very nice, interesting story. And but but so so, if you if t if it takes that much energy to basically get in, so it's very uh, important then to take take every advantage you can later on uh, in the uh, during the process. So, Dylan, Luca, Vladimir, and Mike, can you take us through? I, I, I we can call it a day in a in a in a winter's batch of white combinator. But basically, can you tell us what's going on on now when you're live in the program um yeah let, let me let me just start with with uh i mean maybe maybe my or luca can tell the day today uh okay. I, I would like to tell the anecdote that really impressed me uh when we got accepted you know we got accepted i think in like late november yeah november, late november. early november mm -hmm. um so we had a two-month period between get being accepted and the program actually starting um and there's two pieces of um kind of information that we got there which i i you know i almost found uh, not possible uh, the first thing was they said that uh the three months ahead of us are going to be the most leveraged three months of our lifetime okay and i was like okay that's some marketing you know um yeah, I imagine a lot of connections, but I, I, I now I, I truly believe that these are the, the three most leveraged months of, of my lifetime, uh, just because the way everything is organized and also uh, how well the, the partners are connected and how well everything works and also what kind of a power the brand Y Combinator actually uh, carries. So that's the first thing. The second thing that I, I you know, another marketing thing that that you know they they tell you you will become the uh, a more formidable version of yourself um again something that i found hard to believe at, at the time but now as we go along you know and i look at each of us uh during this process um it is certainly true we are becoming more formidable with with each day so now for day to day guys hit it <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Mondays, we have group office hours. So within YC, there are now four groups. Uh, and within each group, we have kind of different sections. And we meet each Monday with, I think, 10 other companies who kind of work in a similar fashion way to what we are doing. So we're kind of in a hardware group having some hardware technology that actually enables us to produce these meets. Uh, and that's wonderful because we have uh, some of these office hours where you have YC partners present and you kind of have a structured conversation about different topics from, I don't know, I think the last topic we had was, what would it take for your company to become $1 billion, billion dollar company? And it's a mental exercise that's quite scary to some extent, uh, but it's also a fun thing to do because normally in a day-to-day -day startup life, you don't kind of go through a napkin math to do like, yeah. oh, I would need to sell this much of that. And then, oh, I'm a billion dollar company. Uh, and then we have office hours without YC partners where we just kind of as companies try to help each other basically so it's more of an unstructured thing but we try to get feedback to each other figure out if anyone can help anyone on this or that uh, and then tuesdays thursdays you have kind of group events where you have uh, yc alumni who come and speak uh, and at first i thought this was going to be at a level of uh watching airbnb founders speak on youtube 
uh, but it's so much more interactive and it's so much more uh, like everything is told, like no bullshit, just the true story of how it went and it really helps you as a founder, for me as a first time founder, kind of gain confidence that even if things kind of seem like shit today, uh, it's not the worst thing in the world. I mean, you can just power through that and eventually you get to a good place. Um, and then in between you have like office hours, you have special office hours where just your company and a partner meet and discuss specific topics, which is amazingly helpful. YC partners kicked us in the ass so many times and only because of them are we now selling uh, these tenderloins at $150 because they encourage us to do so. I mean, it's not like we would be today i mean we might be selling today in a similar fashion but i really think that them kind of pushing us to it led to the point that we are today um and uh then you have kind of events sprinkled in between so kind of more focused topics uh and, but the first week that might be worth mentioning is we had a yc boot camp which is like a three five day event i don't even remember uh where you have kind of like condensed uh, topics and you have like eight hours a day straight up just these are the things you need to know and you have like all day just talks which were also amazing led by really people who are in top of their class in their respective areas so I think that was extremely helpful as well I hope that kind of answers the day-to-day -day, yeah uh, in terms of YC but beyond that we just do everything we would normally do we kind of slave away with the machine producing uh steaks with our iron cow uh make sure we can feed as many people as possible and have fun to it while doing it but but the process now is is virtual so it's online yeah for you yeah so yeah, you basically correct. you have your headphones on and you're focused on your screens and you go in, in your uh, uh your time this was uh live so you were there in san francisco for the program yeah. And it took yeah, I mean, three, uh, three months to go through. Until until last year, it was uh, um, it was a requirement that you are uh, physically present, um, and uh, it's a uh, I don't know what the what the batch is, uh, how long the batch is right now. It, it was three months, and I believe it's still the same um, because you still need time. You know, the idea of, of, of for for what your YC participation is to is to make. Um, an amount of progress in your business that is that is unusually large, and and that's where the kind of the, the whole idea of, of the most leveraged time comes from. So normally in this in these three months you would you know you would achieve X. They try to get you to achieve 10x, and the, the way they try yeah. to get you to achieve 10x is by uh, you know all means necessary. So they give you funding, they give you information, they give you knowledge, they give you experience, they give you. Uh, they try to give you courage, you know, which was also mentioned. Uh, so that they try to equip you, but ultimately it's still it's still down to you, you know. So uh, you know, I, I fully realize that for someone listening to this discussion, it's um, it, it sounds a little like utopia or something like that. You know, that's everything so amazing, they're so great, blah blah blah. But it's it, it is it is to to some degree, um, you know. Um, it's a, a, a weird process of, of uh, um, it's very it's very difficult to describe because it, it is a, it is a group of people who are trying to achieve the same thing um, doing the different things but yeah. achieve the same amount of progress and, and the same outcome um, who also give each other energy I don't know how that energy is you know, translated uh, today over over um, uh, over Zooms, etc. Et but uh, definitely physically, you feel it mm -hmm. uh, when you walk into that room um, um, when it when it was in person. Um, and and the objective is yeah to 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 just get you to 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 grow as much as possible and then and get, and achieve a fun. Usually, it's the fundraising is the is the outcome of of that yeah. entire process. Um, and they don't they don't hide you know uh, from that fact that the process is for that's where they make money is is to yeah. you know they invest at a certain fixed valuation for everyone and then they try to get you to the to the best possible place. I mean it's also good for founders uh, and it's clearly good uh, for YC um, and I think it it's it usually it works out and what what they say is also you know that was something that it was funny when you know that first session you have uh, um, is like okay so you're here now we gave you the money right 
you can choose not to come to any of these sessions anymore. We can't take our money back. Um, okay. You can do whatever you want with the money. We can't do anything, right? It's done. It's a done deal. You can, you know, go on vacation and we won't see you. The only thing we can do is not have you at the demo day. That's that's the that's the last leverage they have. However. You know, there's much more than you can achieve if you do come to these things um, and if you do um, uh, try to take uh, as much, uh, uh, of, um, you know, of assistance as you can. Yeah. And, uh, and we've seen companies uh, and founders fall off uh, right in, in, the, in yeah. the middle of the process. You just, you know, where, where are those guys? I haven't seen them in a while. Right. And then people yeah. stop yeah. coming. Uh, founders get into fights. Uh, companies fall apart, even throughout the program. And, and you hear a lot of. A lot of scary stories, both from alumni as well as the uh, as well as your cohort uh, of, of uh, batchmates that are going through the same process. So it's definitely a interesting learning experience. If I can just right. give a quick reply. So in, in terms of that uh, kind of like a hive mentality, we're talking about where you come to an event and there's this buzz going on and people kind of lifting each other up. It's almost some sort of like competing amongst each other, but in the most friendliest way imaginable. And I think that even through Zoom, this is still going on amazingly well. Like if I can give an example, last week we had group office hours, or no, not last week, this Monday. And there's an Australian guy in our kind of this group. And later on in the Slack, he sent me kind of like a screenshot that he sent to one of his friends who runs one of the largest Australian, like they have a food chain. He was pressuring him to buy our stakes online for $150. And it's like, mate, you're from Australia. You know me for the last three months. We interacted on a couple of occasions and they're so fucking supportive. I mean, you, you wouldn't imagine it. And they're making something totally different, not entirely food related. In, uh, and the support you get is just immense. I wouldn't imagine getting that from a complete stranger anywhere else. We're, we're not used to that as here. I agree. Just one, one, uh, one comment. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys heard, heard it, but Luca has a weird perception of, of uh, time, uh, apparently. So he's not sure if it was last week or this week, or <laughs> it was three days or five days. That's the leverage, right? You feel like it was three weeks ago, but in fact, it was Monday because so much has happened. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's normal. It's okay. Yeah. That's that's why they they developed a Chrome plugin that kind of counts down the days. So every time you open a new tab, you see how much days is left. And I swear, sure. I swear, I forgot the date. I just look at that number now. It's like, oh, it's like twenty five days left. Okay. <laughs> so you're like Robinson Crusoe. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Carving out and all of these things that, that we're discussing, I think these are all instructive. You know, uh, I mean, this is this is a Silicon Gardens uh, meetup, right? This, is, you know, we're, we're definitely trying to 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 encourage the same type of uh, community here. But it is truly the, the the community amongst founders where you know this kind of friendly competitiveness, competitiveness in a sense that you're 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 trying to win by being better, not by trying to sabotage someone else. You're trying to win yeah. by being you know, as good as them and while helping them be as, be as, as, as good as possible. So it, it, it truly is the, the um, you know, uh, a very interesting um, uh, group dynamics there. And it's something that uh, I think any startup community, um, you know, would aspire to, to, to achieve, but it's super difficult. Um, you, need, you, know, you need numbers, you need time, you need yeah. certain um, rules and, and respect uh, that need to be maintained. And, uh, and then they somehow do that very, very well. Yeah, well said, yeah. So, so guys, you said this program makes you uh, uh, more formidable yourselves uh, and uh, it pushes you to grow faster and, and uh, grow 10x instead of 1x, etc. But it also, I guess, pushed you very strategically or operationally into changing your brand. So rebranding from Bevo to, to, to Juicy Marbles and Formidable Foods. Could you please take us through the, the, you know, the, the, the mental process? Did you always start of Bevo just being a placeholder name or this is, you know, how, how did this evolve through, through the, the Y Combinator? Yeah. Honestly, honestly, a bit of a bit of history about the name Bevo. Okay. Actually, Please. in the uh, in the early days at the at our studies at um, university, we attended all events and hackathons with the name Bevo, 
okay. which which basically meant uh, biological, ecological, vegan, and organic. And we were doing some some stuff with you know something. And uh, even even at the hackathon in Kamnik, where we met Tilan, we our bioreactor was actually named Bevo for some reason. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it it at, at that point it just sounded something that uh, we felt part of. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we were thinking of a name for a company, and we were thinking of what would be you know our future goal for the company, we didn't think of any other name that would better describe what we are as a team, and that's why we named it Bevo. But it was never meant to be, you know, like a brand name. It was always something that's just, you know, the three of us doing some silly stuff together. Um, and when it, when the time was um, uh, ripe for some products to be sold, uh, Bevo was, uh, you know, getting to be less less appealing. Mm -hmm. maybe, well, not maybe... to mention, it sounds like beverage. I mean, yeah. maybe I might have <laughs> yeah, gone yeah. with Bevo, okay, but true. I mean, yeah. for us, it was like, a, it would be a suicide to go out with that. Uh, but yeah, we then tried to rebrand, it didn't go well, uh, and thankfully Vladimir came along with his kind of like skill in uh, skill set uh, and kind of helped, helped us go through it. So I think if it makes sense, I would now give actually the word to Vlad to kind of walk through the process of how we kind of went from Bevo to something more appealing. You mean to Juicy Marbles? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Precisely, maybe. Yeah, well, I mean... It when they, when, they, when they approached me, they were formidable foods, right? And I actually liked it in, in the beginning because I, I just, the word formidable, I, it's, 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 it was good, but uh, and it sounds nice. But then I was reading this book and um, I just copied a little excerpt from, from that book that kind of was talking about uh, um, how you as a brand, you want to position yourself and own a category and I don't know exactly what it said, but it made us all realize the same thing. Because as soon as I posted it, we were all like, okay, it needs to change. Because when you think about the current state of the category, plant-based meat, right? You have Beyond Meat, Impossible Foods, Incredible This. Yeah. Uh, 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 Formidable Fits. Yeah. yeah, so it's basically, it was adjective plus foods or meat. Yeah, yeah. So... We were like, we don't want to just be one of those brands, right? Part of uh, 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 everybody's thought process in this company was that we want to carve our own little universe and not think too much about what the industry is doing. Like, we don't want to be a copy paste of, of the industry in that sense. So the name can give a clear uh, um, kind of already sim sim signal. Yeah. We're not going to play all, all the way by the rules, right? So, but the, the, the actual thought process behind it was pretty simple, right? We, we were doing some workshops together. We were brainstorming a lot. And as we were doing it, uh, um, we were just gathering a word pool of, of mm -hmm. different words that we like. Lush, you know, scrumptious, succulent, this and that. It was just a huge list of words. And then we started mashing them together. And uh, Juicy Marbles kind of went nicely off the tongue. It had um, other, other names were like Chunky Thoughts and, yeah. and, and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> it was a lot of different combinations. So it was a very spontaneous process. And then suddenly, you know, because of marbling and meat and because of juiciness that we kind of want to be associated with and our product definitely is juicy. Uh, um, we just saw that we could have a lot of brand play, a lot of fun with the name. It represented the category well. Um, it, it kind of was kind of talking about marbling, but not at the same time. So it's not really saying anything, and it is. Marbles, by definition, we saw were, uh, you know, like losing your marbles brains. Later on, I mean, and we were aware of the second connotation of, of uh, uh, testicles. We were warned by, by Tracy. <laughs> from uh, YC and she was like, I can't let you go out in the market like this guys. But uh, I don't know, it just kind of stuck and we, we kind of maybe don't mind if somebody gets poked a little bit by it. Mm. We, we definitely don't want to talk about juicy testicles, but if somebody is so saucy, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, they can have go that ahead. kind of, yeah. yeah. So that was kind of- for me. Sorry, 
no, the thing that did it for me, because I was the one who was kind of pushing back, I think, hard against marbles, because the immediate connotation was really testicular. But what did it for me is when I was kind of testing it out with people who I was talking to, I said, look, how do you feel about the name Juicy Marbles? And one guy said, it's very visceral. And that for me was like, perfect. So it can be polarizing, it can be a strong name. I don't care if some people don't like it. The only thing that was important to me, it was like, I'm gonna re you're gonna remember that name and you're gonna know exactly what it is. It's, it's not gonna cause you to be like steak Juicy Marbles, but just as soon as you saw the picture Juicy Marbles and then our steak, the next time you would hear Juicy Marbles, you'd be immediately know what it was. And yeah. I also like my, my, my interpretation that it sounds like a superhero, right? So all of these things combined and now we have our little own uh, mascot or whatever you want to call it, Mr. Marbles, the cool cat that kind of is like anything we want him to be at this point because we don't know who he is yet. So yeah, it's all kind of evolving nicely. That's good. I suggest uh, uh, everybody go and see their, their website, juicymarbles.com and you'll be you know, confronted with everything they just uh, said. So uh, it's read, very, read, very nice. Read the blog. Read the blog. The blog is new. Okay. Yeah, you, you just can, published you can, the blog. You, yeah, very nice. You can uh, put it in the, the chat so people can then just go through, uh, go to it. Um, you I have a question for you uh, regarding the rebranding. So I guess mm -hmm. uh, the guys had a perfect opportunity to do it. Uh, with the program and basically getting uh, to the market, you know, how would you comment on uh, what, what, what are your thoughts on the, when is it good to, to do rebranding and when is it too late? Is there any, you know, advice you could give on that? I mean, uh, again, by no means a, a branding expert or anything, but just kind of uh, thinking um, on the basic level um you you want to do it um when it's early enough that uh that uh, um you're you're not you know wasting too much of of a brand equity that you've built or you do it late enough where um where your customers are there you're not going to lose them overnight just because you change the name or whatever um and uh you, you're more confident that you can do it now and that people are going to follow that brand whatever um whatever it is and and then there's you know there's I guess two important aspects of it. One is kind of re a lot of people when you talk about rebranding, they're talking just about the visual identity. We're talking yeah. about name change here. That's yeah. that's a huge crucial huge. difference. Yeah. Um, you know, visual rebranding is always you're, you're never going to satisfy people, and then in hindsight it might be great, um, but at, at the at the point at, at the moment you're going to have <clears throat> problems. Renaming is 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 a very different animal. Um, you know, but to the point of like when is it too late? We have uh, TransferWise, which is a huge company, Unicorn, about to go public, et cetera, that just rebranded, that just yeah, changed yeah. their name to from Wise. TransferWise to Wise, right? So it's but, never too late, okay. um, but it has to be a good point in time um, to do it. And it has to be a, a really good reason. You know, and the reason why they're doing it is, is to, 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 to signal that they are more than just money transfer. They're, yeah. they're money everything, they're money wise. Um, and, and in this case, I think the, re I mean, this rebranding was, was obviously needed, right? Uh, as much as I love what, uh, BEVO stands for, um, it's not a consumer facing brand. So this yeah. is, this isn't truly a rebranding. This is a branding, um, yeah. Yeah. uh, process that was, that happened. Sure. Cool. And, and another thing that, you know, stands out at least for me is that, uh, you're actually, um, you know, your, your product is, uh, patentable but what you did at the end is not actually go for patent on the product but on the production process am i right so could you tell them perhaps could you you know explain why did you decide to do it like that and you know yeah what kind of benefits does it does it uh... so uh, maybe a little bit of a back backstory on on the on the whole ip um so um having spent the last you know 10 plus years in, in, in IT, IP was really never a big, a big concern. You know, it was always, you know, you have to move faster and, you know, yeah. okay. You know, maybe you will, you will encounter some patent troll later on or something like that, but in, in actually in food and, you know, food is more prone to patents or to, because it's just closer to more traditional industries. Uh, you know, it's more prone to stealing ideas, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so when we developed the machine, we kind of knew that 
what, because we wanted to simplify the, 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 the general idea for the machine is, was already public knowledge. So we knew that you know, it's not patentable per se, but we were very careful when we improved the machine or made it like work the way we wanted to work to, to, to have those elements patentable. And uh, you know what investors NYC, you know, suggest guys, you should have some IP, you know, it will, you know, it will drive your valuation, it will you know, make you more defendable, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, we, we got a really good advice from Julien actually. He said, look, you know, guys, don't, don't try to do it yourself, you know, get a, get a patent, a patent attorney. Yeah. Um, so we, 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 you know, we, we interviewed several and, and the, the one advice that kind of uh, really was resonating with me was you need to have a, pat, a team of expert, experts to, to, to write the patent. So it's not just an, you know, a mechanical engineer, it's not just a you know, food engineer, but you have, a, you have to have an interdisciplinary team. So we found one in the, in the company in the UK that we went with and they basically unveiled how, how you know, I, I wasn't even aware of it, but like that you can actually be strategic about placing your, your patent application, that it covers, you know, it kind of uh, supports you, the patent application itself supports you uh, with your strategy. You know, if this happens, then this part of the patent will, will go. If this happens, this part of the patent. And to be, to be honest, uh, I got, I got uh, aware that the possibility of actually patenting the process exists where I was talking to a, to a pharma startup um, you know, mm -hmm. by, by a Slovenian guy and they basically patented the production process for their compound. compound. Um, so we, we explored the idea of how, you know, what could be that. And there's several benefits, right? For example, if you patent the machine, um, you kind of cannot, um, you, you know, the patent is public. So, you know, everybody can look and see what's patentable and, and, and you know, you, you keep those Copy. machines in a factory, you know, nobody will see it. So the advice was, you know, uh, protect the machine with trade secrets, patent the process. Um, and we went with this and it now is, you know, we went, you know, we followed good advice, but now we realize that that advice was really much, much better than we thought so on so many levels. Mm -hmm. Super. Cool. I, I think at this point, it's, um, uh, you will allow me just a quick reminder for everybody listening in. Uh, we have about five minutes left uh, for the last part of our uh, chat. And um, afterwards, we have a Q&A session. Um, so it's basically time for you to think of questions and uh, basically, you know, things that we might have not covered yet. Uh, and you know, put them, uh, put your questions in the chat, or you know, wait for for the Q and A. But I'll just say that uh, we'll have about, I guess, fifteen minutes. So whoever comes uh, first uh, will will get their answer. Um, that's it. So back to back back to the the, the um, juicy marbles. Um, in the beginning, uh, Gregor mentioned. Um, that you just did a test, uh, a pricing test. You you upped your prices. Um, I think so, somebody mentioned a, a tenderloin for one hundred and fifty dollars. Um, so basically, what I would like to you know to hear from you is what's your current state status? You're playing with prices. You're you're printing meat. Basically, how far along are you with the YC uh, uh, program? And you know, um, basically, how can people taste your steaks at the moment? Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, that's kind of three questions in, in one. Yeah, um, the first is, you know, go, go and, and buy them at, at shop.juicymarbles.com. Um, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the first. The second, the second question was about, uh, about pricing or the first actually. Um, I was acutely aware of the fact that we need to... Um, optimize our prices and um that we need to achieve some sort of a like you know um insane margin on the actual product if we wanted to do what we what we wanted to do so you know it it you know when, when we started mixing together the things uh you know and we build a did a cost of build right you know how much does it cost for the for the materials you know 
I knew from the start that we have something on our hands because you know even even at the, at that level you know we we could achieve price parity even on the on the uh, so on the wholesale prices of of uh, this product which which mm -hmm. is okay for example for chicken that that would be a much harder thing to do yeah um, but then with with kind of uh, you know checking out what what uh, how to price the product um uh, it's it, it wasn't really a, a clear intention but we knew that we had to we we now have the chance to increase the prices to the maximum level possible because we because we have so many excuses right when when we hit when we sold out the first uh, the first couple of batches uh, you know, the advice from YC was, guys, you know, just, just increase the price and we increase the price once. And, you know, again, it was, I knew that we had to do it, but it, increasing prices is always difficult. You always have yeah. this fear of what's going to happen, what's going to happen, what's going to happen. Uh, then, you know, uh, one of the most commonly heard phrases or advice from YC is just blame it on us, right? You know, just blame <laughs> it on us, you know, whatever happens, you know. Fuck off an investor, just blame it on us. You know, don't have time to do this, just blame it on us. So uh, same was with pricing. So we, we basically knew that, and we increased the price once um, uh, and, you know, things just worked out fine. But then we were really put under pressure in terms of having to move at the same time, um, well, move look to, a, to the new location at the same time being sold out at the same time, you know, uh, dealing with with the fact that there's a lot of uh, orders coming from the U.S. and that we have a significant portion of the cost being the shipping, um, and basically, you know, we said, look, um, you know, just find an anchor point, like you know, make it make it so that somehow people are going to like. Can we frame the price so that it kind of seems reasonable, if not affordable? Uh, and the, the trick that did it for us was that my somewhere, you know, researched a bit and he, he realized that, you know, the price of Wagyu beef is like, you know, twice or even three times as much as we are currently charging. And, you know, yeah. the, the answer was, on, on, you know, presented, you know, we are half the price of Wagyu beef. So it, we're uh, you know, bar almost a bargain. Plus, uh, I, I must say that um, the, the loin product, so which is actually just four steaks, you know, before we cut them apart. Um, kind of resonates better with with consumers in terms of perception of a uh, high price. I don't I don't know exactly why. Maybe it's the versatility. Maybe it's the realism because it, it you know you get it, you cut it. It's it's one more step of realism. Uh, uh, plus, you get more product, so you, you're not getting you know 150, 140 grams, but you're getting 600 grams, which is also like you know more than a pound. And we just got more familiar with, uh, or not familiar, but more uh, uh, cozy with, with, with uh, you know, the, the higher price. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not the last price. We kind of uh, want to do, so the, 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 our vision is to basically, um, you know, follow Tesla's uh, approach and, and, you know, make super expensive products so the technology can ripen so that then you can make cheaper and cheaper product as you grow. Uh, you know, ideal world would be, you know, right now we have to kill one whole cow to get like, you know, a, you know, 1.5 kilos of a, of a tenderloin, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the, the average kilo of a cow is sold for like less than a euro, but the, the loin is sold for like 20 plus in, in Slovenia, right? Mm -hmm. We have the option to basically only do tenderloins. You know, we, we can, you know, we put in one ton of materials and we get one ton of tenderloin out. So essentially this will allow us to make premium cuts of meat affordable to, to masses, right? That's personally, that's, that's the end stage that I want to see happen. Uh, but right now we know that we need to basically, um, you know, get the margins so that we can grow the company. Mm -hmm. Your output. And, and this is the only one. The, yeah. This is the only thing that that comes out of a you know of a process of like going through an accelerator. This is this is already super uh, powerful, right? The guys now have the 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 guts to do it. The words describe why the the um, parallels to draw um, to 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 contextualize why you're doing this, um, and and it's it's a completely different story than 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 being just cynical and saying oh. 
we can charge more because we can, right? So you have reasons why you have uh, courage, uh, uh, why and you have yeah. context of why you're able to do it and why that's still a good idea. And ultimately, this is all just a, a different way of saying, um, you know, who you know who your customer is and who you're talking to, um, and you're able to speak the language uh, that they need to hear. Um, and yes, it's a completely different. Uh, I mean, even for myself, you know, when I was buying two pieces of of uh, of the of the uh, of filet mignon like pieces mm -hmm. of tenderloin pieces, it felt expensive. But 150 for for that 600 gram, which is arguably much more expensive uh, on a per gram piece, but it, yeah. it feels more affordable. So it it, it works because the, the perception is different. So true. So true. And and guys, what's what's in it? for you for the next few months so one of the uh, one part of the first question was uh, how far along are you in, in the yc process and you know what are you looking for what are the key, key milestones of uh, 2021 yeah, yeah so I mean, easy fundraise make bigger machines make more products dominate the world with plant-based steaks <laughs> all, all, all in 2021 Oh, no, I mean, they'll start the domination of world with yeah. plant-based steaks. Let's put it like that. <laughs> no, but I mean, yeah, it's like that. We're now gearing up towards demo day. We're starting our fundraising preparations. We're taking on some calls with investors uh, to kind of make this into a bigger thing than it is right now. We're extremely happy and proud of what we were able to achieve in the last few months. Uh, and we want to keep with the similar trajectory. Uh, so it's important for us right now to kind of take a step forward uh, to increase the throughput to enable more people to buy it because I mean as we increase the throughput we'll be able to decrease the price and we'll continue to do so until we until we are able as Dylan mentioned beat the price of beef which we are hoping to be able to do in 2021. Fantastic. Anybody to add anything to this? Meet, meet Woody Harrelson. Meet with us. Okay. Well, thank you guys. Um, I think we, we've used up our time. Um, I think thank you again for for you know chatting to us. Uh, basically, uh, I think that the audience has got what they came for, what they were looking for. Um, hopefully, they have some questions to ask for you. So so stick a little bit uh, with me. Um, let's see. Just, just give me a second. I will see whether there is.